G'day folks, it's me, Greg Nash. We're back. We're looking at Microsoft Fabric. We're becoming fabriculous, I think was the thing that we put in the chat last time. Or with, it's the road to becoming a Fabricorn, which is the new name, I think, not Power BI Unicorn. So uh, welcome to the journey uh, today. I think last week, so we've got our little um, Fabric uh, solution set up. We were setting up a HR Fabric solution. We set up a lake house. It's called HR Lake House. Here it is. Oh, I'm going to turn on my Zoom. Let me do that. Uh, we also set up a data flow. So, um, and then it failed. I don't know if you remember, but it failed at the end and we were sad. Um, it failed because I tried to refresh it while it was publishing, I think. That is my guess. So, uh, this... Oh, oh, that was interesting. Zoomed in on the wrong. Okay, so this guy here, this little data flow, this was failing. But I, since uh, all I did, I didn't do anything special other than to I republish the data flow, and then I hit refresh, and it worked. So that's where we're up to. So now in our HR data lake, um, lake house, if we have a look, we have got a couple of tables loaded. Now, there's been some interesting developments since, um, well, last week they announced the pricing. So I do want to have a look at that. I think we'll look at that first so that I don't forget. I said I would look at it last week and I forgot because I got too excited with all the cool things we were doing. So let's look at the pricing stuff so that we know what fabric's um, pricing. Power tips, oh, Power BI tips are calling themselves the fabricators. Uh, Fabricorns is better. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, there's going to be, I, I like fabric as a, as a concept. It's great because you can do things made out of fabric. Uh, there's like web, there's like, there's all sorts of interesting and it's a good word. It's a good alliteration word. You know, it's got hard, it's got B's and C's in it. I just like it as a word. So fabric, I'm happy about fabric. I think it's a good selection for a brand. They, I don't know if Microsoft always get it right, but I feel like they got it right this time. Data fabric, that's the thing. You know, it all works. It just, just works. It is a little confusing with that other offering, though, which is service fabric, which is what happens that's if true. you start Googling fabric at the moment. That is true. That is true. There is an existing Azure service uh, called Service Fabric, which is, uh, I should know this because I'm supposed to be an Azure architect. It's a, it's like a service bus type thing, like for, multi, for doing it's a like fabric. It's like Kubernetes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's always something else called something else, right? Data flow is my <laughs> number one example where everything's called data flow. Uh, cool. So the other thing I wanted to do is introduce you to this end-to-end -end scenarios, which was also published last week. Um, I'll pop this in the chat. Nothing's original exactly. Uh these are this is a blog that released uh, a few different fabric scenarios so we've got the lake house end-to-end -end scenario we've got a data warehouse end-to-end -end scenario we've got a data science end-to-end -end scenario and we've got a real-time analytics end-to-end -end scenario and i really feel like that's probably the things i wanted to cover as part of this series so i'm probably just going to follow these scenarios and check them out and we'll have a look at where we run into issues or what we think is still a bit clunky i'm really interested in the real-time stuff because this is like i haven't done much custo stuff at all um, I've done a bit of real time on Power BI using kind of um, using stream analytics and and event hubs, but I, I definitely haven't used this kind of modern architecture. So I'm really looking forward to that. But that'll be at the end when I know what I'm talking about when it comes to fabric, I guess. Um, I wonder if the fabric pricing is here easily. If someone can look up the fabric pricing and put the link in the chat, I appreciate that because I uh, don't have it ready. Um, but the first scenario we're looking at is going to be our lake house end-to-end -end scenario. And that's because that's the one we've already really started. This is the one we've been working on so far. And if we have a look at this uh, image, we can... I wonder if I can open this image up in a new tab and then zoom in on it a little bit. All right. This is really what we've been talking about. So we talked about... you've different structured and unstructured data. We'll talk about shortcuts at some point. I'm not sure if I'll get to shortcuts this session, but I definitely, we do want to talk about shortcuts. This is uh, another word for it is data virtualization. Uh, you'll see a little bit of stuff around that. So if you're interested in that, um, I saw a really great uh, like introduction to OneLake and all that kind of um, stuff as well. I think Guy in a Cube did it with um, 
with one of the Microsoft, uh, with the guy who's running one like, and I can't, his name's fallen out of my head for some reason. I want to say Lucas, maybe not. Uh, so, but we are using pipelines and data flows to get our data. So that's what we just did with those employee tables. We use both a pipeline and a data flow or data flow if you're Australian. <laughs> and, uh, and then we're storing it in a lake house and we're kind of up to this bit. And this is the bit where I'm not strong. Okay, so notebooks and 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 Spark and PySpark. This is not my area for sure. So I wanted to run through this scenario so that we can at least see some how this is done. Um, but I'll be fumbling my way through this bit. SQL endpoint, no problem. Power BI, obviously, no problem. So we'll be able to do some stuff like that. And then we'll also talk a little bit about Direct Lake, which I think this scenario is what it enables. Um, I'm kind of interested in what the performance of Direct Lake is like compared to just Power BI running natively Vertipack type stuff. It's supposed to be pretty good. And then what are the limitations? Do we have the same sorts of limitations that we have in Power Query? That's my second question. Uh, not, sorry, Power Query, in, uh, in Direct Query. Like, do you have limitations in your DAX and things like that when you're using Direct Lake? Mm, question mark. And I want to know, when should I use a notebook to transform my data versus a data flow because I'm a Power Query guy. I like data flows and I'm really good at data flows and I'm no good at notebooks. So when do I have to use a notebook? I'm guessing it's going to be about scale. But anyway, that's my open questions. A bolt of data. Oh, I like that, Darren. Oh, and well, Josh Kaplan. Thank you, Darren. You have correct. Yes, it was Josh Kaplan. Uh, I said Lucas, but it was Josh Kaplan. Yes. Uh, available for purchase. Chanley's put in the thing, our capacity sizes and prices. Thank you very much, Chanley. All right. So sizing is different to premium. And they also have an SKU called F16, which I saw people were excited about on Twitter at one point. Um, so we've got F SKUs, the F SKUs. So we have the A SKUs and the E SKUs and the P SKUs, and now the F SKUs for Fabric. So that's interesting. Let's read a bit of this preamble. I can tell you that um, Microsoft pricing is always based uh, like this kind of capacity pricing. Once you've been doing Azure for a little while, you kind of start getting your head around it. It's basically just an amalgamation. This this unit that they create for each service, in this case, it's a capacity unit, uh, is an amalgamation of how much computing power it takes and how much memory it takes to give you what you want to do. Okay, so that's the why they so they create a unit for each one. So you might have seen a data warehouse unit, for example, in um, in Azure SQL Data Warehouse or whatever. That's a that or in Synapse. That's a that's a unit that they've created to kind of uh, measure how much compute and memory it takes to use your data warehouse. So in this case, we're talking about capacity unit. And so they say it here, capacity unit. These are the, how many units you get uh, for each fabric SKU. So, so your you get two units of capacity here. Now it doesn't that doesn't mean you get two CPUs or eight gigs of memory. Like it's not as hard and fast as that. That's why they kind of amalgamate the two things. Um, but uh, so it's hard to translate back to that, and you probably would have to do like you probably need to do some wizardry in the back end to actually understand how many exact virtual CPUs and how much exact memory you get. Um, I think they do they abstract it for a reason so that they can kind of play around with the back end and still keep it uh, at the front end of where you get two units. Well, two units today might mean, you know, two virtual CPUs and eight gigs of RAM. And then tomorrow it might be you get 16 gigs of RAM and four virtual CPUs because you know, everything's more powerful and they've got more capacity or whatever. So that's, I think, why they abstract it like that. They can kind of hide that front end of that back end from you so that they can uh, mess around with it depending on how much demand there is for the service. Okay, so then we've got pay-as-you-go pricing for capacity. So if you don't, uh, so yeah, capacity is how much capacity you're using on the Azure service or on the Office 365 service. Um, the price uniquely across you across regions, which isn't surprisingly. So our US West Azure region is 18 cents per CU per hour. 
whereas in a different area it might be something different so in australia it's likely to be different and we might i wonder if the pricing is actually on the pricing page we might be able to look at it there in australian dollars but this will be all in us dollars for us west too okay so so keep in mind that might change slightly uh, i think this is the most interesting thing the bottom the entry point for it for fabric is really low compare it compared to like your premium right premium starts here at about a thousand bucks a month us so p1 is about a thousand bucks oh it's about 870 something i think from memory in us dollars which turns works out to be about a thousand australian or whatever um so really low entry and that's i really like that because i think that's been a pain point for a lot of people i know you could use premium per user and you could kind of get your premium stuff that way if you had a small number of users but i do like that they've got a capacity that's quite low i think this architecture lends itself to a low cost kind of small business um data warehousing or data lake house kind of um solution and so i like that there's a low entry point that you can kind of give to some of those smaller customers that potentially are only going to use some of these features um but you can still build like a properly architected lake house for them right so we've got an entry level that I can build and scale on a lake house from from a pretty small um, cost per month. So I'm pretty happy with that. And then you can see it gets real serious if you get up to the very top, the 2048 SKU. That's for banks and giant institutions or whatever doing this stuff. But you're paying per hour as well, which I quite like. So you've got an hourly or a monthly option. So these monthly options probably work out to be slightly cheaper than the hourly options. I can't remember. The hourly options are good because you can usually, if they have an hourly option in Azure, that means you can turn it off and on again whenever you want. So you can potentially run Fabric super cheap. If you say turned it off overnight and only ran it, you know, maybe you run it for a couple of hours in the morning to load all your data for that day, and then you're running it during the day for to load some reporting or whatever, and then turn it off again. You could run this super cheap if you're kind of interested on in manually doing it, like you're paying 36 cents an hour, right? So uh, I love having a cheap option to, for people to be able to get into this technology when they're still small businesses and then scale it up as they scale. I really think that that's a good strategy for Microsoft, so I'm really happy with that. Uh, according to Andrew, for New Zealand, AU East on F2 is about five hundred dollars New five hundred New Zealand dollars a month. Okay, so it is, yeah, New Zealand dollars. And that's that's pretty close to Australian dollars, though, isn't it? So it's going to be four or five hundred bucks Australian per month. So it's still a little little pricey, but not too bad. P1 equals F64. There you go. Yeah, interesting. We're getting spotlight jokes about fabric in the vault of data. I like it. Okay, and then, so that's just for your compute capacity. You're also going to pay one, potentially one like storage. I don't know how they're going to do, oh, that, it looks like they've got a, it's just, that's two cents per gigabyte per month. Storage is always super cheap. You you rarely, under this architecture, you, you're you rarely going to get stung by storage uh, costs because your storage is always going to be super cheap that's the that is literally the reason why you look at our, um lake house architectures because of how cheap it is to store your data so when you've got terabytes and terabytes of data you can throw it all in there and have it ready to be queried and you're not paying for a giant sql server to store that data all of that data and the compute capacity to, in order to query it just sitting there waiting for you to do that i think that's if there's one big differentiator between your traditional data warehouse and your lake house is that your lake house you can store the the your information really cheaply you can just have it sitting there ready to go and you're not paying for all this compute capacity that you're not using because you have to you know once a month process it or whatever it is um It'd be interesting to know which regions are available. I don't know uh, whether maybe we could look on the Azure portal. I might see if it's on the pricing page for the Azure portal. Let me look over here. If I just go into the Azure portal, can I just look for fabric and start buying stuff? Probably can. Let me see. Create a resource. I'm just I'm just off screen at the moment, but I'll be with you in a sec. Microsoft Fabric Preview. All right, here it is. I'm back. I'm back. 
Here's the Microsoft Fabric preview in the Azure portal. Let's have a look. It just says create. Does it give me, oh, here's my plans. Doesn't, yeah, okay, let's say create. What's it gonna do? Okay, create it. Okay, so here's my re available regions. Okay, Southeast Asia region, it's available. Is it available in Australia? Let's go with Australia East because that's the most likely. Looks like it. Here's the F8. Here's the pricing in Australian dollars, 420 bucks a month. There you go. So, so if I did that, my tenant location is Southeast Asia because I've got an old Office 365 tenant. I really have to transfer it over. So it's gonna it's saying, hey, you're you're it's giving me this error saying, well, it's not an error, but it's a warning about, well, don't create your resources in a different tenant. So theoretically, I should create it in Southeast Asia. Um, but it looks like it's available in it would it wouldn't show these regions if it wasn't available, right? I'm trying to remember in the Azure portal. I'm pretty sure it won't. So I think it's available everywhere. I think it's available everywhere. That's great. Okay, so it's available everywhere and you can do it right now. Awesome. Um, Fabric admin portal under capacity settings. So yeah, the admin portal for Power BI is now called the Fabric admin portal. That changed during the update. Um, and yeah, all the user groups are called Fabric user groups now and everything's Fabric. When you start Power BI, it says Fabric. So the changes are coming. All right, let's get into doing some stuff. Um, does anyone have any que other questions about pricing? I think that's probably covered enough pricing. It's nice and cheap in some areas. It's kind of good. And what is there anything else we would need to pay for? Let me just double check that. Okay, so we're going to pay for a capacity. That's going to give us our fabric workspace. And then we can just put stuff in there and we can put anything in there. It doesn't limit us in any way. And then we need storage. Capacity is for everyone. Starts with a very low entry point. Yes. Okay. Doesn't say anything else. I think it's just storage and capacity. That's all we'll pay for. Very cool. Um, if you're interested in learning about the One Lake storage, like I said, Josh Kaplan and Guy in a Cube did a uh, an interesting little intro to One Lake. Uh, it just came out on on YouTube. So check out uh, check out Guy in a Cube's intro to One Lake because it just goes through. There's a couple of little scenarios that I hadn't thought of that they they run through. Cool. All right. Pricing and one like that's all we pay for. So let's talk about our uh, ingestion. So we're going to we're going to redo our pipeline and data flow. So first we're going to bring in some data using a data flow. Then we're going to bring in some data using a pipeline. The data in the data flow is going to just be a CSV file using upload, which I hadn't actually done last time I loaded it to this to the lake house first so you can apparently you can just directly upload into the data flow so we'll have a look at that um and then we'll do a little bit of uh pi python i think pi spark i think it is it might be it might be scala i think it's pi spark that they use to do the notebook and then hopefully we'll get to the point where we can create some power bi so let's do it um so i'm going to be following this lake house tutorial i'll put the link in the chat uh, feel free to check it out. Oh, yeah, egress charges for one lake. Maybe there is some egress charges. If you, you're going to get egress charges if you ever move data out of Azure. That's true. Uh, you're going to get egress charges if you create all your reports in Power BI and they're already probably not because they're already, they don't move anywhere. Well, I wonder about that. Egress would only apply if you're moving data out of one lake to a different Azure region. There you go. Darren has answered it. For those of you who don't know Darren, he works for Microsoft. So he's a very good resource to uh, to ask questions of. He also wrote Dax Studio, so he's a genius, but we don't talk about that. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> little plug, Darren. Got any latest updates? <laughs> the OK, so we're doing Sorry, I'm getting I'm confused myself. All right, but we're going to do the Lake House tutorial. Here we go. Oh, there's that uh, YouTube thing. Awesome. Right. Um, I'm going to drag it off the screen, though, so that you can't see all the dumb things I'm doing. 
Uh, I'm also going to skip through it pretty quickly, so I didn't want to confuse you while we're um, through because I have already kind of read it. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, I'm going to start probably start a new. This is my great lake at HR Lake House. I might continue with this one later, but I'm going to start a new one. I'll keep it in. Maybe I should create a whole new workspace because we're still in trial mode, and I don't. I want to keep it pretty clean so that you can see which artifacts are being created because we already get lots of artifacts in in our lake house right and so i think it's interesting to see that all right so i'm going to create a new lake house workspace it's going to be called what is this this is going to be called lake house demo demo uh, we make sure that it's got under the trial which it is i'm not going to assign it a domain this time okay we've got a brand new workspace the first thing we're going to do is create a Gen 2 data flow. I have in my possession a CSV file. The CSV file is going to be uploaded. Um, I guess we just do a get data. Where was this upload that it was talking about? Maybe I'm wrong and I just misread it. Let me just check. Okay, get your CSV file in the Power BI services. Yes, doing some. Open your workspace. Oh, from the experience, hang on, from the experience switcher located at the bottom left, click data engineering. What is this business? Oh, cool. I haven't seen this before. See, these are the things that you find out. Look at this. There's a button. And it has things. I want to be a data engineer today. Close the data flow, okay. Unbelievable. <laughs> okay, now I've got a new my data engineering. Okay, so then it says create a new lake house. Uh, so we're creating a lake house. Okay, and we're going to call the lake lake house W Wide World Importers Lake House. Hang on, now we spoke about this. We're not going to call lake it lake house. house. Name. <laughs> don't don't put lake house in the name. That's Dr. Greg said we shouldn't do it, so we're not going to. I'm going to call it Wide World Importers. You know, there's okay. a great oh. restaurant in uh, Dalesford called the Lake House. <laughs> oh, there is too. Yeah, that's a yeah, it's a famous famous restaurant. Okay, so we created our like. Okay, so then we're just uploading our. Oh no, it does say new data flow Gen two. Okay, click on this button. And then, wait, wait, does this affect Power Apps? By the way. No, this is this would be separate from Power Apps for sure. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, import a text CSV file, and then we say upload file here. That's where it came from. So, so, so you got to say get data text CSV, and then upload files here. Okay, so that's where you can do the upload file. Now I've got the file here on my off my screen. Dimension customer CSV. I'm just going to drag it in here. I'm already connected to my stuff. Hit go. Make sure I can see yours. The fabric don't. Fa are we just going to be fabric engineer? Is it or a fabric engine? No, I can't. I can't. I can't figure out a way to shorten that. Fabricorn. That's the name. Okay. Okay. It's comma comma delimited. Looks good. Put this here, and then I'll put my tutorial here, and then I'll be able to do all the things. And I think there's not much to necessarily change. These are date times. That's important. There's no spaces in the column names. That's also important. We learned that last week, yeah? So we're going to add our data destination as the lake house, exactly the same as we did last week. Next to the lake house, boom. And we want to throw it in our lake house demo. This search is horrible. What did I call the thing? I called it Lake House Demo, didn't I? Yeah, I did. See, it just doesn't find stuff. Oh, man, this navigation experience is horrible. I think we already spoke about that, though, didn't we? Is it? Is my Lake House not there? 
doesn't it like me. I need to clear the search filter. Dodgy. Yeah, didn't we work out sometimes it's case sensitive and sometimes it's not? Oh, you're right. Oh, I'm sorry. Look at that. There it is. Wide world importers I should have searched for, not Lake House. Terrible. So that navig I'm I've already raised it, but I'm gonna raise it again. I <laughs> feel like that navigation experience is no good. Okay. Um okay, whole cut okay, so it didn't remember it gave us errors last time. We didn't get errors in the area, so we're good to go. We're gonna save our settings. I'm just gonna hit publish. Now don't hit refresh straight away. Look at all these artifacts it created though for one data flow. It didn't even have the data flow in it. It created like all these data flow staging lake houses and warehouses all just to give me a data flow so that's just keep that in mind it's going to create stuff does it create a new this is a question does it create a new data flow staging lake house and warehouse for every data flow or does it just create one as if you have a data flow in your fabric i think it'll only create one that's my guess yeah and they will be hidden going forwards oh they'll be hidden will they going forward Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, so, they're, so they're, they're only there to area. service. Yeah, cool. That makes sense. So it's a bug that they're showing up now, but they didn't get it fixed before preview. Oh, nice. Okay, so that's that's good to know. So it's just a, like a temp file, scratch space for them. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that's what I figured. It was just it's just bringing them in to service the data flow. So, yeah, I was surprised that they showed up. Okay, that's great. That'll clean these um these uh these workspaces up. Okay, so um, when it's when it's when it's publishing, you get a little spinny cycle circle here, and then when it's refreshing, you get a spinny circle here. I noticed. So here's our spinny circle over here on the right. So while it's publishing, this is actually a the refresh button's enabled, and if you hit that, it'll break it. That's what I did last week. What you should do is wait for it to finish publishing, and then it automatically refreshes itself. It looks like. Shelly says, is this going to end up like old school access where we, we prefix every item to indicate what it is, e.g. E LH, wide world importers, DF, what it may be. Maybe that's the old, just like in um, when you're creating, I do this in Power Apps still, like if I have a, if I'm naming a label, I call it LBL underscore and then the name of the label. And if I'm naming a button, I call it BTN underscore and then name the button. And if I'm, and if it's a text box, it's TXT underscore and then the text box, just so that I know what the artifact type is when I'm looking at the names. And you might, well, yeah, we might come up with a naming convention like that at some point. Um, but so, for, but so we don't, I don't know if I can, I wonder if I can independently rename this SQL endpoint that's different to a name from the lake house. I don't think I can see. I can't see it. I don't have an option to rename this. Let's click in and see if I can rename it. This is called Greg trying to break the system. No, there's no way for me to rename it or do anything to change this. So it, I think it must be, well, that's cool. Looks like that uh, dimension loaded. Which is very nice. SQL endpoint just works. Um, but there's no way for me to rename that. Which is a little unfortunate because I have to click on one of these to get to my lake house. Now to do that from a UI perspective, I have to know this symbol is the lake house, or I have to look over here and read lake house before I click on the right one. Um, that's maybe I've maybe got some feedback around the UI for that too. Would be nice if it had a little proof. I guess the symbols are probably good enough, although those two symbols are pretty similar. Anyway, I digress like always. Okay, so our data flow loaded and then our lake house, we know the table works because it worked in the SQL endpoint. There it is, dimension customer. Okay, on to the next thing. The spinny circle will spin, it says. Once the data flow is refreshed, go to the table, have a look at the SQL endpoint, create a query. You can, okay, we could run this. Let's run the query so we can see it. So we had a look at the table. We can, oh, it doesn't say SQL endpoint. Why can't I go to SQL endpoint from here? Do I need to? Oh, SQL endpoint successfully created. Is it really? Wow, we just had to wait. New SQL query. Here's a query I created earlier. 
So we're just doing a standard select count, uh, buying group and count it as total from Dimension Customers by buying group, make sure it works. And it does. So Toddler Toys has 23 rows and Wingtip Toys has 201. There you go. SQL works. Back to our lake house. I like this little navigation guy. This is cool. Up in the top right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, we could build a report on top of this. I'm not going to do that. Oh, I just got an internal error. Uh, I'm not going to do the report building. We'll do that later. Because I want to skip to the, basically to the bit where we're kind of up to. We've already done this last week. So the next thing we're going to do is create a pipeline. So to bring some more data. And we're going to bring that data from Azure Data Lake Gen 2, one of, uh, one of Microsoft's repos. Okay. So let's close our lake house. We're going to create a, well, let's go back to our wide world importers. No, not the endpoint. So you've got to learn what these symbols are. That's the lake house. That's the endpoint. That's a different lake house. That's the demo. Okay, here we go. I'm going to say new data pipeline. Create a new data pipeline. Now we'll call this WWI underscore ingest. That'll do. I didn't like also that it didn't give me the option to name my data flow when I first opened it, like it does for all the other artifacts. I have to. Rem I always forget to rename those data flows, so I've always got data flow one, data flow two, data flow three. Anyway, um, okay. I created my data pipeline. We're going to create a copy data activity. Oh, well, we're going to do it manually. Oh, okay. This could take longer than I expect because I have to flick through all the different bits and pieces. But let's see how we go. Okay, we're going to call this data copy to Lakehouse to LH. I'm going to use LH from now on when I need to type Lake House. It's too long. We're going to get an external blob storage. Okay. External connection. No. New connection. Yes. Which is this button. Sorry, I might have done that too quickly. So this is like a like link services, you know, like in in. Uh, in data factory we're going to pull it out of it says azure blob storage not data like gen 2. okay i'll trust it continue can i go from blob storage we're going to pull it out of this special place that our going to be an anonymous so this is obviously a public blob that um, Microsoft have published so that we can use this it's called Azure Synapse storage blob .get test slash sample data authentication type is anonymous I'm going to create a new connection the connection name is going to be called WWI sample data authentication kind is anonymous create the create buttons over the left here and then normally it's over the right on other dialogues little inconsistencies i don't know i'm going to start taking notes actually because i've got to send all this feedback to people all right we got it it's checked it's binary all that thing is correct our file path needs to be the correct file path which is going to be sample data Sample data, wide port world importers DW slash RK. Okay, so we're looking for that's the location of our data under sample data, wide world importers DW slash parquet. That's where it's going to live. And then under destination, I've got all the rest right here. Yeah. It all looks all good. It's called WWI sample data Greg N. Oh, it puts my name after it. That's interesting. Okay. Workspace data store. It's going to be a lake house. I'm going to select our lake house, wide world importers. Did that work? Or did I misclick? No, that worked. Okay. 
under files, www, does this create a new path for me? I'm sure it does. Surely it does. Raw data. Slash file name. It's going to be binary. I don't think we need to do any mappings because we're doing like a binary load. I think that's it. Don't need it. Oh, does it need to be? That doesn't need to be external, does it? No. Save. Oh, whoops! I said save as. I shouldn't have. I said just save. Saving, saving, saving. I'll click the validate button. Just make sure it's validates, which it's surely it validates. There's only one thing. All right, we're going to run it. See what happens. We can monitor the execution under the output tab. Yeah. Okay, it's in progress. Here it is. Data copy to Lakehouse happening. So this is exactly what we did last time as well. Um, we did the data flow. Well, we, first we did the pipeline last time. We just loaded a file from the Lakehouse to the Lakehouse though. This time we actually used it from an external from an external source, which is cool. Um, I might go back and have a look at those sources that you can pull from as external sources as well. So I think that's cool. Okay, that looked like it ran successfully. If we have a look at these sources, I just want to create a new connection. Okay, what are our sources here? Because obviously data flows, you've got lots of sources and then pipelines. This is the same that we had last time with pipelines. It's a cut down kind of list of the main big dogs. Everything, uh, S3 is there, which is nice. I think that's pretty much everything you'd need in the short term. Oh, OData is there. That's cool. I've got some OData stuff that I want to bring in. That should be pretty serviceable. But if you're doing bulk load, you want it to be in one of these sources first anyway, right? Because you're going to use pipe pipelines for bulk load of, of, of information. So what has this done? This data copy has now copied a whole bunch of files out of the blob storage in Azure that Microsoft supplied to our data lake. Okay, so now we should be able to see in our data lake inside. I'm looking at the SQL endpoint. Let me look at the data lake. We have now these files. Now it was a binary copy, right? So we've copied the files over. We didn't copy the tables. We didn't copy them as tables. So we've got these full and incremental. We've got a full loads of these dimensions and then the incremental loads of the fact uh, of the fact table. So the next step is for us to take these dimensions and bring them in as tables into our uh, lake house. So that's what we'll be doing. All right. Uh, can you send an email once the uh, pipelines are complete? Yes, I'm absolutely sure you would be able to do that. I'd be very surprised if you couldn't. That's exactly what pipelines are good at, that kind of stuff, that kind of loading and letting you know and throwing errors and doing things when things don't work. All that kind of stuff is exactly what you want out of pipelines. Um... Okay, this is the bit where I'm no good. So you're going to have to bear with me while I read carefully. The, okay, so the first thing we need to do is get the source code, which is from the Lakehouse tutorial source code folder, which I should have. I do have. There's an IPYMB and a, which is a Jupyter notebook file, and a data transform business aggregates. Here are the two files. Um, I'm getting this from the Git the fabric samples git, which is in the link to of the tutorial. Okay. So if you're wondering where I'm getting the files from, you just download them from the, the GitHub. Download them from the GitHub. So, <laughs> anyway. Okay. So I'm back to data engineering. I need to import a notebook. Can I import a new notebook in existing notebook? Okay. Hang on. Let's go to this page. There's notebook, uh, import notebook. Here it is. Look at this. There it is. Okay, so we're going to import our notebook. Upload the notebooks. 
click the upload button, I presume. Find this location. Here's my note. Can I do two more than once? You can select multiple. Yes, I can. Cool. Importing, importing. Okay, they've been, let's go to the workspace. They've been, they've been, oh, look at that. Notebooks have been imported and now they appear as stuff inside my lovely, oh, wait, did I import them to the wrong lake house? Oh, no, I didn't. That's right. This is the right one. Cool. Well, that would have been wrong. That would have been scary. Okay, I've got two notebooks. Now we want to go to the lake house. Wide World Importers Lake House, open notebook, existing notebook. Here are my notebooks. And the first notebook I want is the Create Delta Tables notebook. Open. So this is an existing Jupyter notebook transformation that I've run, I could potentially have run in, the, in my Databricks or whatever that I can now bring over to this, to this section here. And we're going to run these Spark notebooks to do stuff. And we are using Python, so it's PySpark. There you go. And you can even open it in VS Code as well. You can open it in VS Code. That's cool. I like that too. Can I run, could I run this from VS Code? What happens if I click this button? I've got VS Code. Should work. Uh, the extension is not installed. Would you like to install it? This, this is off screen because it opened on the other screen. And then it said install and open. Here it is. And now it's saying installing the extension for Synapse VS Code down the bottom here. How cool is that? Can't install the release because I probably got the wrong version of Visual Studio Code or something. That was unexpected. I didn't expect to be doing that. So I won't, won't bother too much. All right. So theoretically, because this is what I'm no good at, I just don't understand uh, Python and Spark. But I'm pretty sure I could just probably just run these notebooks. Is that what we're going to do? I think that's what we're going to do. Let me check on the. OK, what does it say here? Open the notebook, have a look at it before you write uh, in the table section. Use the f use two fabric features, V order and optimize write to optimize data writing for improved reading performance. To enable these features in your session, set the configurations in the first cell of your notebook. Ooh. To start the notebook and all its execution cells in sequence, select run all. Uh, so is it, uh, it's V order is enabled, right? I thought I had to do something, but it's saying it's setting these configurations here, V order. So this is optimizing it for write. V order and optimize write. So that's what this first cell does, optimize write. And then it creates this fact table and then it creates the dimension table, city, date, employee, and stock. So that's cool. So I could click play and then play and then play, or I could click run all at the top and it'll execute them all in sequence. Okay, so I'm gonna click run all because that's what it tells me to do. Or you can hit shift enter well with when you've executed when you're selected in here. That's cool. So if you've got if you're inside one of the cells, you hit shift enter and it'll run that cell for you. That's probably a spark thing, but I didn't know that. I like it. In these notebooks, do you have the ability to um use like magic commands at the front to like swap it to SQL like you do in Databricks? Great question. No idea. Let me look that up. Though. Is there any, uh, is there any yeah, fabrics? Sure oh, yeah. Darren said pretty sure you can. It's just pretty sure it's standard Spark. Yeah, yeah, okay. That. What, and what's in the language selector at the top? Can you just, yep. you know, default it to SQL? Sure can. Oh, wow. Cool. So you can choose Python, Scala, R, or SQL as your as your preferred Spark thing. Uh, so it's running the things. You can see my little execution guys going round and round. It's running each of these uh, tables. So what we should see after fax sale is hopefully tables start populating here on the right, left-hand side, right? Fax sale hopefully will come through. Let me learn some Spark while I'm here. So what am I doing here? All right, so from functions, import the column year, month, and quarter from a table named fax sale. Spark, okay. Okay. 
spark.read.format parquet load. Okay, so that says this to me says load a parquet file located here. With column year, create a, okay, so it's creating a year from the invoice date key column. It's creating a um, quarter from the invoice date key column and the month from the invoice date key column. So there's this import at the top here related to these three. I guess it does. It shows how. Uh, no, 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 no. That's, that's, that's the module inside the function. So. Are oh, the year, you, quarter, month, mod, are these functions here? Is that, yeah, sorry, let yeah. me. So in order to be able to do a year function here, this year function, I have to have it up here. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so it's just importing function. those yep. Py Spark SQL functions, but you'd get the same yep. thing if you're if you're just running as SQL like in the notebook. Yeah, yeah, cool. Okay. Okay, so it creates it imports this, then it creates a year, quarter, month column inside the fact table. Not a big fan of that, gonna say, just saying it right now. Probably shouldn't do that in a fact table, but we'll continue on. Uh <laughs> Write mode, overwrite, format delta, partition by year quarter, tables slash tables. Okay, so it's going to create del delta tables, partition them by year and quarter, and save them in table slash under this tables area uh, with the, then the name of the table. So in this case, I'm guessing it's going to be fax sale. There you go. That's my interpretation of what that code does. And then... Inter interestingly, usually unless you've got really big tables, you probably wouldn't be partitioning with, with Delta. I think the optimal bucket size they recommend is like a gig per parquet file when you're kind of splitting it up. Yeah, if you're yeah. partitioning it that much, they're probably going to be less optimal. True. I wonder how big this data set is. We didn't check. I guess we'll find out soon. Okay, that ex executed, that executed. Now, I'm not seeing it over here yet, but I probably need to refresh this view for it to work. So, right click and select refresh on the warehouse. Oh, you mean like, no, isn't there a, do I just refresh, literally just refresh like this? I'm gonna try it. I think there was another refresh button, but I just refreshed the whole page. Loading, loading, loading. Look at that. So that's, so we've used Spark to create our city, customer date, employee, stock item, and fact sale, custom uh, dimension and fact tables. Loading it from that blob storage data. Uh, which ones did we already have? The mentioned stock item. That was the one we loaded from um, CSV. So why do we do that in Spark instead of data flows? Because Spark's better at doing stuff at scale. And you can see it's actually not a lot of code to load all of those um, load all of those dimensions, right? That loaded four dimension tables, and it's like, what, 15 lines of code. If you had to do those dimension tables in Power Query, it's going to it's going to be like you got to create a query for each one. And there's no way to, oh, you, no, you, you would because you get different outputs. So, so Spark is going to be your friend if you're going to do these types of bulk load things. You can potentially do things a lot more efficiently. So this is why they recommend that in, the, in this architecture that you use Spark for your data loads and transformations. Now, I wonder, did they do a join, any kind of joins? They didn't really, did they? Um, anyway, so there's three, that means there's three different ways you can kind of load data into your lake house, right? You can use a pipeline to load into a, either a file or into a table, probably. You can use direct data flows to load data into tables, or you can use Spark or whatever they call it this, which is probably Synapse something <laughs> synapse so i don't know the name sorry synapse engineering i don't know something like that you can use synapse not spark all right but speak synapse spark okay now we're going to do some transformations so this is the next bit so now we go home to our lake house we're going to go to our week wwi lake house here it is we're going to open a new existing notebook. I'm going to open the second notebook. 
That was create delta tables. This is the data transformation notebook. Okay. Business aggregation. So now we're setting this right optimization piece. So we did that at the beginning there. And now we're going to do some stuff to some joins and stuff. So here we go. And so this is where you can you probably have a choice of using SQL or you can use Scala or you can use Python, depending on how what you prefer to use. And I think, yeah, like I said, the benefit of this is going to be you're going to use these this Spark stuff because it's going to be really good at doing stuff in parallel and at scale. So it's going to it's going to process this much more efficiently than Power Query ever could. So if you're coming from that Power Query world, like a lot of you will because you're Power BI people, this is just better at it. It's just faster at it. It's got it's more efficient at the way that it, in the way that it does it. Unfortunately, it does mean you need to learn a whole new language. Or if you know a bit of Python, it's probably a little bit easier, but you do have to learn a whole new syntax. Or if you're already doing SQL, use Spark SQL. It'll do all the same stuff and it'll still execute using all those efficiencies. So, um, but this is, I think I'm settling more and more on this is definitely the way to go pretty much all the time. There's maybe if you're doing just some small tables, you could get away with doing it in Power Query or in you know data flows uh, to get you going. But I think this is definitely worth learning if this is new to you. I'm definitely learning it. OK, so we're running the notebook. Uh, we, an organization, it says here, an organization might have data engineers working with Scala or Python and other engineers who work with SQL, like T-SQL or Spark SQL, all working on the same copy of the data. My, Fabric makes it possible for different groups with varied experience and preferences to work and collaborate. The two different approaches transform and generate business aggregates. You can pick the one suitable for you or mix and match. So that's kind of what we were saying. If you like Spark, or if you like Python, use Python. If you like SQL, use SQL. And that really is the beauty of this type of um, this type of uh, approach. The okay, thing so that concerns me will be on the actual management of it. Like as this stuff gets out into the wild, it, it's mm. you know the potential to do some really bad queries. I mean, it's all got Git integration, though, know, so we just need to work on the ways of working i guess yeah i think it's it the the platform supports as many things as it could it's then it i think it then comes back to your your work processes and your and your the way that you just would control code anyway you know like and i think that's how it should be like you shouldn't be limited by the platform um to to be able to do this if you're bringing people in who have python and can do all the same things as the people as that do sql i don't then the platform supports both. I think that's a good thing. So yeah, I think it's really, um, really one of those things. The, uh, weird, the weird delineation for big organisations is that so many Power BI tenants are still kind of managed more on the business side as opposed mm. to whereas the Azure assets are like managed on the IT side, and there's a little yeah. bit of a separation. Big it's time. It's just new. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I, it's interesting, isn't it? And I wonder if this will help break that down because you often see data teams living more on the business side, you know, and that's kind of where they should be because they're going to be interacting with business SMEs or they're the SMEs themselves, you know, like under the Microsoft model, everybody does this stuff. And so it's going to be interesting to see how this platform kind of adoption goes with this platform. And then I think... IT will be kind of happy to relinquish a lot of this stuff, right? Because it's a management overhead that they often are given that they don't really know a lot about and they're not really that interested in because they've got other things to worry about. So, yeah. Okay, so we're looking at the two approaches here. So we've got this. This is the Spark approach using Spark, Spark language, which is in this case Python, PySpark. And then down here we've got just good old-fashioned SQL. So you can just put you do your SQL and then it says Spark SQL down here, right? So to the point they're making here is that two different people from different backgrounds can both work on the same data set and get and create aggregations or whatever in the same notebook, uh, which is cool. I like that. Okay, and then I think we just run it. I don't think I need to do anything. I don't need to be fancy here. Um, so I'll run those while we're 
checking out the next bit. Oh, it's literally build some reports in Power BI. Nice. Yeah, it's I want to know if I can click, I can click off this and it'll still run, right? It's not going to break anything. I don't know. Let me see. Oh, it didn't actually click off anyway. Load data. Oh, I can load via Spark. I can refresh. I can copy the path. Uh oh, code cell ran into an error. Don't tell me I had to do something. Go to cell. Oh, because it's got the wrong name. That's what I get, but not. Okay, stop session. WWI Lakehouse. It's not called WWI Lakehouse. It's called Wild World Importers. That's what I get for not following the tutorial. Does that mean this optimization didn't work last time? In? I don't know. What? Wide World Importers. Did somebody notice that and put it in the chat before I even think? Probably. Apologies if you did. Wide World Importers. That's right, isn't it? Yep. And then this one. Oh, do I need to? Uh, it was already, it already broke at that point. Let me just ch check the rest. I think that's it, is it? That looks like it. It was just the one. All right, let's try again. Querying session status. Run, run, run. Okay, that's all good. Hopefully that'll work. There you go. I just edited my first Python, Spark Python code. Go me. The question is, will I will I have done it correctly? Running, running. We just want to see this successful and then I'll relax. Command executed. You, you. All right. Nice one. Um, Okay, what sort of Power BI reports are we going to build? I'm going to run ahead here. Build a report. We're going to use Direct Lake. Yes. Go to the lake house. Go to the endpoint. Model. Oh, we're going to literally model. Okay, this is going to be cool. I've never done it this way. Okay, so that's running. Uh-oh, there must be another reference to it. There is a... Uh, Okay, let me just double, triple check. There isn't another reference in here. That was it. Now I can, let me, if I click in here and say shift enter, it'll run that cell, right? Hey, look at that. Succeeded, three of three. Yeah, it ran the SQL quickly, didn't it? I'm like a pro, shift entering. All right, done. So I should validate this by, let me just go back. I should see an aggregate sale date. Oh, I've got to refresh. Refresh. Oh, let me save first. Uh, wait, can I just save? Why is it saying save as? Why can't I just save? Well, oh, save options automatic. Okay. Well, it's saved. I have to assume. Aggregate sale by date city. There it is. It's a nice aggregate table for our for our Power BI report. And aggregate sales by date employee. There you go. And then, all right, we're ready to go for the last bit. We've got a couple of minutes. Ah, uh, yes, domains, people. Talking domains. So if I go here to my SQL endpoint, this puts me in warehouse mode. Okay, so now I'm in warehouse mode. The wide world importers warehouse. Here's my tables. Uh, so this is very SQL like. It's got functions, store procedures, views. I've got my I've got my user structure, oh my um, sorry, my namespaces, 
we got users. So that's very familiar to me. I like, I know what's going on here as a SQL person. Okay. I've got my aggregate things. Which one do I need to select any of them? No. And then down the very bottom here, I've got model. And so I can set up my model. Look at this. Aggregate sales by date. There's all my things. Let me go like that. Ooh, I've got lots of tables. Okay, I need to define the relationships between the drag city key to city. And okay, so we've got a fact sale. That's going to be in the middle. Can I make this bigger so that it like, looks like a fact table? Because that's how I roll. It does. Okay, cool. Oh, oh, oh. Do I need to zoom? I probably need to zoom. Let me move some of these things over here and then do that again. Okay. Okay, big fact table. Where's my city? Here's my city. There's my city key to city key. Don't worry, I can see it. I'm just going to do these relationships quickly. I assume you guys know how relationships work. If you don't know how relationships work, then uh, there's lots of you Power BI you tutorials happening. All right, did that work? Or Oh, man, it just changed views suddenly on me. City key to city key, that worked. Hey, it rearranged the, and it changed my fact table. Oh. Default data set for faster reporting was created and be automatically updated with any tables added to the lake house. Oh, so it's just literally going to continually add. So it doesn't really matter if I move these around because as soon as I create a relationship, is it going to rearrange them for me again? Oh, that's kind of annoying, I have to admit. All right, customer key to customer key. Let's try. Uh, make it active, one to many to one. Can you up? I'm, Wait, I'm that was the wrong way. Under the table tools, does it have like a, you know, auto find all of them or whatever? Oh, maybe. Let me check. What? The relationship cardinality. If you drag oh. from the fact table to the dimension. Oh, did I? I went, I went there. Oh, okay. I went back. It should work time. both ways, but it's, yeah. Okay, <laughs> my bad, my bad. <laughs> okay. It's not quite as smart as Power BI Desktop yet. No, yep. See, this is how lazy I've become. Okay, so we go from yeah. dimension. So keep that in mind no, if you're modeling. Go from the fact to the dimension. Oh, from, from the fact to the dimension. Is it the yeah. other way around? Okay. Yeah. Okay, got it. Many to one, factor dimension, got it. Hopefully they'll fix it soon, but yeah. Well, thanks. For, I would have been really stuck on that if you weren't here, Darren. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, which which date are we doing? Both or delivery date? Invoice date? Okay. I think the city Invoice. dimensions backwards too at the moment. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay, I'll fix that. Invoice date key to date. Many to one factor dimension. City to city. Uh, yeah, re okay, refresh the model. Oh, uh, that's date, that's customer. That model refresh thing's kind of weird. All right, we bring them all over again so that I can see it. This is janky to say the least. All right. City to city. Is there an auto? No, there's no. I don't see anything about relationships anyway. I think I have to do this manually. What, what's in the ribbon under the table tools? Oh, new measure and incremental refresh. Yeah, every now and then it kind of refreshes and then puts all the tables back. I guess it's like updating. For, it's like because it's direct lake, right? So it's updating from the latest stuff it finds in the, I don't know exactly what's happening there. but Okay, stock item key to stock item key. Yeah, I was going to say that's a new one. I haven't seen it jump around like that before. Mm. Definitely not how it's designed to work. And then employee key to employee key. 
uh, that'll be salesperson key, right? Salesperson key to employee. This is wide world import as I remember. Okay. Right, jank complete. Just in time, hopefully. Oh, look at that. And then we've got these aggregate tables. I don't know if they want relationships there, do they? Is this all working though? That looks all good. Oh, yeah, it's freaking me out. Okay, it's working. Look, we've got a star schema. Uh, do we need the aggregate tables? It doesn't look like we need the aggregate tables to be related to anything. Reporting, new report. Here we are in the creating a report experience here in the web. This is, you can do this in, oh look, we've got all of our things. So, okay, let's just check that our relationships are working. I'm just gonna do total sales by city or something. Um, taxable amount, oh, look at that, created a, oops. Oh, look, it did seem to work, maybe. Relationships are working. All right. What did it want us to do? WW importers profit reporting. Okay, we're going to create, we're going to report on our profit. First thing we're going to do is insert a text box. Don't have much time, so I'm going to jump through this. Create a profit report. Make it 42 or something. Add a card. Bring in the profit. Doink. 17 billion. Doing well. Add a bar chart. Which one? Clustered. We're going to do sales territory. Uh, what is where does sales territory come from? It's come from customer. Dimension city, sorry. City, sales territory. Profit, profit. Not creating any fancy measures here. Looks good. Winning. Stacked area chart. Ooh. I like a stacked area chart. Oh, it's not a very good one. Uh, stock item, my buying package, and fiscal month number. Okay, so we need profit. Buying package. And fiscal month number. I think I put those in the wrong thing, but I'll fix it. Don't worry. I think that should go there, and then that should go there. No, I do it the wrong way around. Fiscal month number. Ah, 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 ah. There, sorry. Hey, carton each and packet. There you go. We're reporting. Um, and then it adds some other stuff. It adds one more thing, but I'm not going to bother doing that because we're out of time. So there you go. That's pretty responsive. So that is end-to-end -end a lake house architecture according to that um according to that tutorial, right? So that gives us the full Sorry, I'm trying to find the oh, I had to go back a few pages. Is this architecture again? So that gives us our full enable ability to pull data in via pipelines and data flows. We then use notebooks, either Spark or SQL to transform that data and put it back into our lake house. And then we pulled it out and put it in either via the SQL endpoint or via Power BI. So that's like literally everything you could want to possibly do. We didn't do shortcuts, but we can talk about that next week. Anyway, I'm going to finish up. Thanks guys. It's great to have you again this week. Um, we're going to continue on with our 
with our end to end scenarios. We're going to do the data warehousing scenario next week. Um, I want to look at these mounts. I don't even know what that means. Um, and then we're going to get into some interesting stuff, be data science and real time. So stick around for those. Hopefully we'll see you next week. Um, if not, have a great weekend as usual. And yeah, I'll be sticking around for a bit if you want to hang around on the team chat. But other than that, we'll see you soon. Okay, bye. Thanks, Greg. See you, mate.